Welcome to the eSchool of the European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. My name is Hildegard Bühning. I'm Professor of Infection Biology and Gene Transfer at Hannover Medical School and currently the President of the ESGCT. The European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy is a nonprofit organization founded already in 1992. We promote fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and genetic vaccination. Education is part of our mission and we therefore launched the eSchool series. Today, we are visiting the area of genome editing and we are very much looking forward to our speaker, which is Professor De uh, Dr. Daniel Bauer. Uh, Professor Bauer is an MD and a PhD and he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, where in his thesis he was focusing on the mechanism of growth factor regulation of the hematopoietic cell metabolism. Currently, he is PI and staff physician at the Dana Farber Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorder Center. He's also assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and associate member of the Broad Institute um, of MIT and Harvard. And today, he will speak about knockout, knock in, repair, and regulate the toolbox of designer nucleases. So, we are very much looking forward to your talk then. Great. Thank you, Hildegard. Um, thanks to ESGCT uh, for including me in this uh, terrific lecture series. So uh, when Hildegard asked me to speak about the gene editing toolbox, I was a little overwhelmed. Uh, the tools are evolving extremely rapidly and it would not be possible to be fully comprehensive in a short lecture. Also, this topic has been covered extensively in the literature and I would direct the audience to some outstanding reviews by pioneers of the technology development. I thought it made the most sense to present from my perspective as a hematologist and physician scientist. The lens of the hematopoietic gene editing field illustrates some of the key features of the genome editing toolbox. Here are my disclosures. So I think it's somewhat fitting to view cutting edge molecular technologies through the lens of sickle cell disease, which is widely considered to be uh, the first molecular disease. Uh, for more than 60 years, it's been appreciated that the entire complex pathophysiology of sickle cell disease stems from a single amino acid substitution of a hemoglobin gene. So uh, sickle cell disease um, emanates from a mutation in the beta uh, subunit of hemoglobin. And in fact, the beta globin gene is encoded from a gene cluster of similar genes, including the parologous uh, gamma globin genes, which are subject to developmental regulation. And in fact, high level expression of uh, gamma globin genes is seen throughout the fetal period and leads to the production of high levels of fetal hemoglobin prior to birth. Fetal hemoglobin level is the main clinical modifier of sickle cell disease. Only after birth, once fetal hemoglobin is silenced, do the manifestations of uh, sickle cell disease emerge. Individuals with high levels of fetal hemoglobin are protected uh, from sickle cell disease. So a main goal in hematology has been to understand the mechanisms that lead to silencing of the fetal globin expression in the adult stage with the idea that one could, uh, as a therapeutic goal, reinduce uh, fetal hemoglobin in the adult stage. So when I joined Stu Orkin's lab as a hematology fellow about 10 years ago, I became interested in how common genetic variation at a locus called BCL11A could influence fetal hemoglobin. So the recently uh, discovered SNPs at the BCL11A locus uh, had been associated with fetal hemoglobin level, as well as with the clinical severity of sickle cell disease um, and the related condition beta thalassemia. But these were not encoding sequences, but were rather within the large second intron. And working with John Stam, we examined the pattern of DNA's one sensitivity in erythroid precursors and found sites of open chromatin overlapping these common intronic genetic variants. And these DNA 
uh, hypersensitivity sites were not found in other cell lineages expressing high levels of BCL11A, such as in the brain or in B lymphocytes, suggesting erythroid specific enhancers. So, this was an early example of one of the frequent observations of GWAS. The human traits are often determined by genetic variation in context specific distal regulatory sequences. So, why am I talking about this? So, I was interested in asking. What was the function of these intronic sequences of B11A? How could I ask that question? And so here I turn to gene editing. Uh, here's an artistic depiction of genome editing. And the idea is to use molecular tools to make specific modifications to sequences in a genome. So one might erase specific sequences to ask what is the functional consequence. So all genome editing tools um, rely on these uh, bifunctional molecules, um, often using um, endonucleases as effectors, but then um, tethered to some DNA targeting part that can achieve specificity within the genome. So here's um, really the birth of genome editing in 1994 uh, by Maria Jason and colleagues. And this is really um, prescient work that has um, held up and, and still uh, elucidates the fundamental principles of genome editing, which are that there's first um, some sort of modification to the genome, often a double strand break, but then the real genome editing occurs because of endogenous cellular repair uh, of that modification. So let's read these highlighted sentences uh, from Professor Jason from 1994. In this study, we created specific double-stranded breaks in mouse chromosomes for the first time using an expression system for a rare cutting endonuclease, IC1. We find that the double-strand breaks are repaired by both homologous and non-homologous mechanisms. Non-homologous repair events frequently result in small deletions after rejoining of the two DNA ends. Some of these appear to occur by simple blunt-ended ligation, whereas several others may occur through annealing of short regions of terminal homology. The double-strand breaks are apparently recombinogenic, stimulating gene targeting of a homologous fragment by more than two orders of magnitude. So that's pretty much gene editing described and continues to hold. And so here's a, a visual description of, of that same um, set of events that after a double strand break is produced in the genome, there's a number of possible repair outcomes that can lead to gene editing. And so one possibility is templated repair shown here in gray could be an extra chromosomal uh, DNA template and this may have a slight change in the uh, underlying sequence. And so then using this template for repair uh, by homologous recombination, one can swap out the original sequences for this templated repair sequence. However, there's um, additional pathways that are occurring concurrently. And these um, are dominated by end joining pathways. And the, the classical end joining pathway is this non-homologous end joining pathway where the two ends may be joined in a manner such that there could be small um, insertions or deletions. These could be one or two or three uh, base pairs um, immediately at the cleavage site, leaving a small scar um, and, and disruption of the underlying sequence. A variation on end joining is microhomology mediated end joining where these uh, terminal uh, microhomology sequences can be used as local templates and lead to collapse uh, of the intervening sequence, leading to a small microhomologous uh, deletion. So how could one achieve this sort of targeted double strand break? So the version one of the genome editing kit used protein as the DNA recognition molecule. It's shown on the top are these naturally occurring um, meganucleases or homing endonucleases. This is the sort of um, nuclease that was used by uh, Professor Jason in, in her, her pioneering studies. And, and these are powerful, but are, are quite um, 
difficult to re-engineer. And so they may have a specificity, a very unique specificity, but it's hard to uh, reprogram them to target new sites. A major advance came with using uh, zinc fingers. Uh, zinc fingers are um, able to recognize small stretches of DNA, typically um, triplet uh, nucleotide sequences. So by stringing together different combinations of zinc fingers, one can achieve uh, nearly any specificity uh, in the genome, although it requires quite a bit of expertise to, to generate and to uh, optimize these tools. A further advance came by using talons or these tail effectors, where um, with these tail repeats, a single repeat has specificity for a single uh, nucleotide. So there's a relatively straightforward code to string these together to get predictable um, targeting. And then by coupling this to a nuclease, in this case, FOC1 uh, nuclease can lead to a targeted double strand break. So this is going back to 2013 when I was a fellow. Uh, this was the hot new technology, the talons. And this is what we decided to do. What was the uh, function of these intronic sequences at B11a? Well, we used talons to create two cleavages surrounding this uh, uh, orthologous mouse um, enhancer sequences, similar to these human sequences marked by uh, GWAS and by DNA sensitivity. And by generating these two cleavages, we could achieve end joining results where the intervening segment was completely deleted. And when the segment was deleted, we observed um, loss of BCLVNA in erythroid cells, suggesting these are critical erythroid specific enhancers. But in non erythroid cells, uh, these same sequences were dispensable for BCLVNA expression. So that was uh, very exciting. Um, and led us to think of many more questions. And at that time, version two of the genome editing toolkit was coming out. And, and this is probably what most of you are familiar with, CRISPR systems, where RNA is the DNA recognition molecule. So these CRISPR systems are naturally occurring uh, bacterial adaptive uh, immune systems where um, bacteria may be exposed to a foreign nucleic acid, such as from phage, that this nucleic acid can be integrated to the bacterial genome in this so-called uh, CRISPR array where these um, foreign sequences are surrounded by um, repetitive um, constant sequences. And at the same locus are these Cas proteins, uh, which encode for nucleases. So then if this CRISPR array is transcribed into RNA, these uh, so-called guide RNAs can guide the nuclease to survey for any similar uh, foreign nucleic acid. And if such a uh, nucleic acids um, encountered can lead to interference where the nucleic acid uh, may be cleaved and thus the bacteria cell uh, protected from subsequent exposure uh, to that invading uh, material. So this um, has really revolutionized genome editing. It's a very um, uh, programmable and modular um, uh, set of um, uh, molecules where there's uh, the protein component, um, the uh, Cas endonuclease, and here I'm showing the most widely uh, used and explored uh, version, which is the uh, Cas9 from strep uh, pyogenes. And so here, what the, the Cas9 uh, um, needs to find a genomic target is this stretch uh, uh, protospacer adjacent sequence, in this case, NGG. And then in the presence of NGG in a genomic target, the um, guide RNA, which is shown here in two parts, a, uh, a CRISPR RNA, which is the spacer sequence, uh, short, stretch of 20 nucleotides that might maybe uh, homologous to the um, uh, underlying uh, protospacer in the DNA adjacent to this PAM sequence, and then coupled to a, a structural tracer RNA or all in one piece as a, a single uh, guide RNA, should this um, spacer sequence uh, 
encounter homologous um, target DNA sequence, it can unwind the double-stranded DNA, lead to a full um, base pairing of the guide RNA to the target DNA, uh, displace this second uh, DNA strand into single-stranded DNA R loop. And then the um, two um, uh, nuclease uh, domains of Cas9 can lead to um, cleavage of both the targeted and non-targeted strand, resulting in a double-strand break. Okay, so here's an artistic depiction of this in a genome of three billion base pairs, um, a Cas9 uh, uh, nuclease coupled to a guide RNA as a ribonucleoprotein can scan the genome for these short stretches shown here in yellow of the um, protospacer adjacent motif, um, NGG for SB Cas9. Once that's been uh, found, uh, there's a search for um, homology between the uh, guide RNA and the target DNA, and in the presence of uh, complete um, Watson-Crick um, base pairing, uh, displacement of this uh, second DNA strand, uh, which leads to a conformational change of, of Cas9, allows the nuclease domains to be active and results in a double strand break. Amazing. So uh, how could this be used in many ways? And I'll just illustrate a few ways. Um, and one way that this system is incredibly useful is to do a, a screen where one can test many um, uh, uh, genomic changes in a single experiment to identify uh, in an agnostic way what are the changes associated uh, with a given phenotype. So here we had uh, used the talons and, and identified this um, B. sylvin A enhancer as a key element uh, modifying the expression of fetal hemoglobin um, and as a potential target for sickle cell disease. And we wanted to understand more clearly what, how was the um, enhancer structured and what could be potential target sequences um, for gene editing. So imagine here is depicted a uh, 100 base pair stretch uh, enhancer. And so within that 100 base pair stretch, there would be on average 12 or 13 of these NGG PAM sequences. So based on that one could design 12 or 13 guide RNAs to be complementary to that target sequence. And then one can make a library of all these possible guide RNAs. And so one of those guide RNAs, if it generates a cleavage, will result in a allelic series where there could be small deletions or insertions. So a, a set of indels uh, that emanate around the uh, target uh, cleavage site. And then by uh, including a library of guide RNAs, one can perform systematic mutagenesis of uh, nearly all um, uh, desired target sequences. So that's uh, what we did. Here we designed all the B7A enhancer targeting guide RNAs cloned as a pool to produce a single lentiviral library, uh, transduce cells at a, a low multiplicity to ensure each cell only received one guide RNA, stained uh, the differentiated cells uh, for fetal hemoglobin, physically separated uh, high fetal hemoglobin cells by flow cytometry, isolated genomic DNA, amplified integrated guide sequences, performed deep sequencing, and then identified guide RNAs that would be enriched at the high fetal hemoglobin pool. By mapping their cleavage sites back to the genome, we could produce a functional enhancer map. And so, uh, this is with the result of, of that sort of an experiment. And this is along with um, Matt Canver, who is then a graduate student and with uh, Feng Zhang at the Broad Institute and Stuart Orkin. So we performed this dense mutagenesis uh, and identified uh, critical minimal sequences at each of the, the three um, B7A DNA's hypersensitive site enhancers, plus 55, plus 58, and plus 62. And in particular at the plus 58 enhancer, we found um, a GATA1 binding site that was an Achilles heel uh, that uh, was really required for fetal hemoglobin silencing and whose disruption gave a profound effect in terms of loss of B sylvanae expression and induction of fetal hemoglobin. 
And so this led to a simple therapeutic vision. One could disrupt a B sylvanae enhancer in hematopoietic stem cells, leading to reinduction uh, to reduce B sylvanae and, and D repression of fetal hemoglobin. And so these ex vivo modified hematopoietic stem cells could serve as an autologous graft for hematopoietic cell transplant. Um, so over um, several years, we investigated how to do this most efficiently in hematopoietic stem cells. And the answer turned out to be using ribonuclear protein. Ribonuclear protein is highly efficient. It's a preformed complex of Cas9 and guide RNA. And it also has advantages in terms of specificity because uh, one can deliver a very short uh, pulse uh, of high level of ribonuclear protein. So there, there may be a high level of on-target editing, but only a short time for off targets to accumulate. So Yu Xuan Wu, when he was postdoc in my lab, working with uh, Scott Wolf, uh, found that uh, electroporation of a nuclear localization signal sequence modified form of SPCAS9 with modified synthetic guide RNAs could lead to highly efficient B11A enhancer editing in human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. So below is a representative amplicon sequencing result with just 2% unedited alleles remaining. Each of these gene edits including the abundant plus one insertion, as well as the succeeding minus 15 and minus 13 microhomology mediated and joining repair alleles disrupts the GATA1 binding site. And so these edited hematopoietic stem progenitor cells show comparable engraftment as control cells. Indels persist at greater than 90% frequency in engrafting cells. B cell A expression is retained in non-erythroid cells like B lymphocytes, but it's reduced by about 80% in erythroid precursors and fetal gamma globin is potently induced. Uh, we could observe similar results using um, pleurixophore mobilized hematopoietic stem progenitor cells from sickle cell disease patients and consistent with therapeutic induction of fetal hemoglobin erythrocytes are protected from in vitro sickle. One observation we uh, made was that um, their microhomology mediated end joining alleles were easily detectable in the input cell product. You can see these as the, these minus 13 and minus 15 deletions, which constituted about a quarter of the alleles in the input cell product. But they were not observed in the engrafting cells in the bone marrow, the recipient mice. And this finding of relative paucity of microhomology mediated end joining alleles in engrafting hematopoietic cells held across uh, 10 edited cell products, 33 recipient mice, two target loci. And it turned out this was predictable merely by sorting and then genotyping the cells immediately after editing based on the immunophenotype uh, of hematopoietic stem cells or based on their cell cycle profile of quiescent cells. So these experiments reveal that the quiescent hematopoietic stem cells preferentially repair by conventional non-homologous end joining. And the implication here is that not only microhomology mediated end joining, but also homology directed repair would be disfavored in quiescent hematopoietic stem cells under this protocol of highly efficient gene editing. And so one could consider uh, multiple potential ways to harness nuclease gene editing for sickle cell disease. Um, one possibility is to use homology directed repair to directly repair the underlying mutation. However, like microhomology mediated end joining, Homology-directed repair is a relatively minor repair pathway in quiescent hematopoietic stem cells. It competes with the concurrent non-homologous end joining and requires co-delivery of a template sequence. So uh, this has been um, uh, studied and improved by a number of labs, including Jacob Korn and, and uh, Matt Porteous and Don Cohn and others. And uh, the results have um, advanced quite a lot in the last few years. And here's um, an example from Jacob Korn's group where uh, using um, highly efficient gene editing methods, they're able to achieve on the order of 30 to 40% corrected allele fraction in input cell products. Um, not shown here are the remainder of the alleles are mainly indels um, with disruption at the beta globin gene target. And then when they do engraftment experiments, what they uh, observe and has been observed by a number of investigators is a relative loss of 
uh, the corrected alleles, so that now they represent somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of the corrected alleles um, in the engrafted cells. And so if one considers this on a per cell basis, and they measured uh, here over 300 individual clones, uh, the blue slices of the pie are uh, cell clones where at least one allele is corrected. That's the desired therapeutic outcome. The green slices still have a, a genotype consistent with sickle cell disease, so they're uncorrected. But actually the largest fraction of the pie, more than half, are these uh, clones that have biallelic indels, disruption of both uh, beta globin genes. So in fact, they no longer would be expected to have a sickle cell disease phenotype, but instead a beta thalassemia major phenotype where they would lack expression of adult hemoglobin and would kind of switch from one <laughs> hematologic to another severe hematologic um, uh, disease state. So um, how what the exact proportion of corrected cells that would be needed to give a therapeutic outcome uh, remains to be explored, but this is a challenge that's faced by homology-directed repair. Another issue when one considers uh, potential challenges of gene editing is off-target genotoxicity. So there may be cleavage not only at the intended target site, but at other sites in the genome. These other sites in the genome tend to have some sequence similarity um, to the on-target site. And so how does one find these and uh, measure these effects and mitigate these effects as needed. There's a number of protocols that have been developed here. I'm showing one, CircleSeq, um, but they all um, uh, share the, the common feature of isolating some sort of uh, DNA, in this case, genomic DNA um, from cells that in this case are in vitro circularized and then uh, exposed to ribonuclear protein Cas9 guide RNA in vitro to find um, those fragments that will be um, cleaved. Um, the adapters can be ligated on the end and, and the ends can be sequenced. And there's a number of these techniques. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all of them, GuideSeq uh, and others that can uh, detect candidate off-target sites that may be cleaved. And so then what typically uh, one does, and what we did working with Sheng Darsai at St. Jude, who helped develop the circle seek method, is perform deep sequencing of these candidate off target sites to see is there actual measurable gene editing in the target cells under the protocol uh, of gene editing being studied. And in this case, where we had extremely high level editing of the B7A enhancer, greater than 90%, at, at 24 of these top candidate sites, we couldn't find any evidence of off target. Um, uh, genotoxicity, suggesting extremely high specificity uh, uh, potential of these gene editing maneuvers. And uh, there's an increasing appreciation that although many uh, different high fidelity uh, forms of Cas9 could be engineered, there, there may be a trade-off between activity and specificity uh, that uh, as uh, um, variants become more and more specific, they may be some cost in terms of loss of on-target activity. And there is no right answer in terms of what's the best um, nuclease to use in the toolbox, but what's the most appropriate for the, the target that's being studied, the, the delivery method, and the uh, desired and, and required specificity. So there's many options. There's numerous Cas9 orthologs, there's engineered variants. And then beyond Cas9, there's alternative Cas families. And I'm just showing here one of the other um, Cas family members, Cas12, because I think it has some illustrative unique features. Unlike Cas9, where the PAM is on the three prime end, here the PAM is on the five prime end. There's a single nuclease domain, uh, RAVC, that leads to a staggered double strand break. Uh, it has a simpler um, uh, CRISPR RNA that's all in one without uh, a second tracer RNA. Um, and so this Cas12 nuclease can also be used to create double strand breaks that then get repaired by the same endogenous uh, cell machinery to give gene editing outcomes. And so why would you use that? One example, we were interested in this common beta thalassemia um, splicing mutation where this T to C mutation creates um, uh, an aberrant uh, splice donor site that activates a cryptic splice acceptor and leads to um, uh, 
an alternative splicing event leading to a frame shift, uh, premature termination, loss of beta globin expression. And we thought, okay, if we can merely disrupt this aberrant splice element, we could restore normal splicing. However, there was no NGG PAM so we, nearby, so we couldn't use SPCAS9. However, there was a perfectly positioned PAM for CAS12A. And so with Scott Wolf, we produced ribonuclear protein, introduced it to primary hematopoietic stem progenitor cells from four patients carrying this beta thalassemia allele. And in each case, we could see um, the aberrant splice product um, could be converted back to the normal splice product by the high level gene editing, we were able to edit about 70% of these um, aberrant um, alleles in these primary hematopoietic cells, leading to um, restoration of adult hemoglobin and normal erythropoiesis in the erythroid progeny. All right, so um, in uh, I'm gonna switch gears and talk briefly about um, kind of future versions of gene editing. Um, and let's say version three could be base editing. Um, so this is really useful for a specific subset of desired gene edits, transition mutations. And unlike uh, HDR, where there's some repaired alleles and then other end joining alleles, this tends to have higher product purity with the, the great predominance of the repair alleles being the desired transition mutation. And this comes in two flavors. There's cytosine uh, base editors and ad ad adenosine base editors. And so these rely on fusions of an attenuated Cas9 that may have only one or no um, um, nuclease domains um, intact. So it's either a nickase or a dead version of Cas9. And then it can be fused to a DMNA, cytidine DMNase or deoxyadenosine DMNase. And so in the case of this uh, C base editor, what happens is the C is deaminated to U, and then the U can proceed on, along a number of um, repair pathways, including base excision repair, which may be undesirable because it can lead to scrambling of the bases and indels. But using a uracil glycosylase inhibitor, which can also be fused onto the C base editor, one can inhibit this sort of repair. And then by introducing a NIC on this target strand, bias the repair towards mismatch repair, in which case this C gets converted to a T and you can get relatively high purity C to T transition. And then with adenine, um, adenosine base editors, one can deaminate adenosine to inosine and eventually get um, uh, to guanine. So one can achieve C to T, T to C, A to G and G to A whether one targets the top or bottom strand. So all four transition mutations are accessible. And so could this be a therapeutic alternative for sickle cell disease? Uh, we thought, um, we know we can disrupt the B7A enhancer with indels. Can we disrupt it with um, base edits? And so um, this is work done by my postdoctoral fellow, Jing Zheng, um, working with Keith Jung's lab and Keith had generated um, a C base editor, apobec 3 a m 57 q which showed high activity and precision as a ribonuclear protein. So when we electroporated this ribonuclear protein to hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, we could achieve high um, uh, uh, base editing um, at this um, underlying uh, GATA binding motif, the same target motif at the B7A enhancer that we have previously explored for nuclease editing. And so here are um, single um, erythroid colonies um, after base editing, um, where we can compare the genotype and the phenotype in terms of the fetal hemoglobin level, the unedited cells have low fetal hemoglobin level, and whether we use Cas9 and create bialyoc indels at this uh, GATA1 binding site, or we use base editor and create uh, uh, bialyoc base edits, in either case, we can get high level fetal hemoglobin induction, suggesting substitution of a single nucleotide within this GATA uh, binding site is sufficient for robust fetal hemoglobin induction. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but we could achieve it in, in uh, sickle cell uh, donor cells as well. And one of the, the big advantages of base editing is it could be multiplex. So here we 
um, evaluated the base editing in um, cells from a thalassemia patient who had a T to C uh, promoter mutation. So with the base editing, we could convert this C back to T. And without going through all the details, what we found was we could either uh, achieve a therapeutic effect uh, by uh, using b 7 a base editing to induce uh, fetal gamma globin or beta globin base editing to restore beta globin expression. And if we combine the two, we could have a greater fraction of cells that had at least one therapeutic edit. And so this indicates you can really achieve uh, synthetic biology with um, uh, numerous uh, desired genetic changes using these base editors. Um, the base editors are competent uh, in engrafting hematopoietic cells. Um, and then finally, there's future versions of the genome editing uh, toolbox. Version four may include prime editors. Um, these are really exciting new tools where there's um, an extended um, guide RNA that includes a primer sequence that um, uh, and then couples um, a Cas9 nickase to reverse transcriptase to use this um, primer sequence to encode um, templated repair and then create this flap um, with templated repair that can then um, ligate in and lead to insertion of um, substitutions or small um, insertion or uh, deletion um, mutations at target sites. This is a very new method and its efficiency and specificity are not yet well understood, uh, especially in primary cells, but it's, it's very exciting and I think indicates that the toolbox is only gonna continue to grow and expand. Um, just to briefly mention, there's also epigenome editing where one can use a fully um, dead version of Cas9, fuse it to various gene uh, regulatory effectors to either activate or uh, repress uh, target gene expression, totally bypassing um, double or single strand breaks of DNA. Um, okay, so uh, when one thinks about sickle cell disease and curative approaches, the toolbox is actually just one small part of the calculation. There's kind of an ever expanding toolbox, but for any therapeutic application, one needs to consider what's really the pathophysiology, what's the molecular goal. In the case of sickle cell disease, there's a couple of goals that could be therapeutic. One could add a globin gene, one could induce uh, this paralogous fetal gamma globin, or one could repair uh, the underlying beta globin mutation. So there, there's a number of options. The delivery is critical, not only um, to get the stem cell um, out um, for ex vivo editing, to get the, the genome editing material into the stem cells, and then to get the modified stem cells back in to the patient. And currently this is complicated and requires um, conditioning therapy with alkylating chemotherapy, which has its own set of toxicities and real world challenges that may limit um, the global reach and access of these current version technologies. All of this needs to be considered in a clinical um, uh, context of risks and benefits in the setting of alternatives. And the future, I, I think, is bright and may include things like in vivo delivery. So when we consider delivery, there's different ways to deliver it. Um, one could consider using nanoparticles or viruses or even ribonuclear proteins directly as means of delivery. Um, I'm not going to go through the pros and cons, but, but this is really um, critical, not just what is the toolbox, but how could we, do we use it in um, target cells that are clinically relevant. So I think there's great opportunities for hematopoietic stem cell gene editing, uh, in particular because um, this is a, a clinically feasible maneuver using um, ex vivo modification, and the blood system is so um, accessible and amenable to monitoring that we can anticipate longitudinal follow-up at a molecular, cellular, and clinical level to understand both the safety and efficacy of gene editing. And I think there's potential to impact major unmet clinical needs, such as sickle cell disease. So with that, um, uh, 
thanks for uh, having me. Uh, thanks to all my colleagues um, and collaborators, funders, and patients who've inspired this work. Um, thanks for your attention. And um, and here's something about Ben Kleinsteiber, who'll be talking um, next week. So thank you very much, Dan. It was beautiful talk and with a lot of details. And I think our audience will really liked it. And um, so uh, from our audience, please, if there are any questions, type them in. I will uh, ask the question then to Dan. And um, I would like to start off with with one question. And you know, we in gene therapy, we we over the years we really worked hard to have the classical gene therapy working, like which we say gene addition. And now all the new options come up with genome editing. So if you would be a student and now would face the idea of really um, uh, do a healing with genes. Um, what is your uh, take of a classical gene therapy approach versus gene editing? So what should be the choice or how should the choice be made? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, um, it's, it's always good to have options. And I think um, I, I, I'm humble enough to say, you know, the technologies are all moving so quickly; it's hard to predict with certainty. Um, but you know, there are um, there are cases uh, where classical gene therapy has had you know tremendous results, and, and so um, for gene editing um, to to compete, it's going to have to show you know equal or, or better results. Um, I think um, a challenge, though, is, you know, how scalable are any of these methods um, to really meet um, global clinical problems? And uh, it seems like the complexity of any of the current therapies is, is so vast that, that it, it will somewhat limit their widespread distribution. Um, where I'm really optimistic about gene editing is the potential simplicity of the underlying method is such that with future technological advances, I would hope it could be um, applied more widely. Um, and I think, you know, the direction of the field of gene editing is such that we have the promise to make almost any desired uh, gene modification and it's figuring out how to do that in a way that's safe and can be, you know, delivered most effectively. I mean, there are some cases where um, there really is no good option for gene addition. Um, you know, we thought a little bit about um, autosomal dominant diseases where uh, merely replacing a healthy version of the gene isn't going to fix the problem. So, um, uh, you know, one such set of diseases we uh, considered was severe congenital neutropenia, where there's dominant mutations of the Alain gene that interfere with neutrophil maturation. And there, I think it's a, a great potential for gene editing to disrupt that um, mutant uh, kind of dominant um, negative allele and then restore uh, normal function. And so I think there are cases um, of gene addition like for some metabolic diseases where you want actually um, supraphysiologic expression of the gene target and then uh, correction in trans um, to other cells, you know, such as in the central nervous system. So I think there's cases where each has unique capabilities and then there's other cases like sickle cell disease where both could be therapeutic and then it's kind of really the details of what's um, safest uh, most effective and simplest. Thanks. I mean, in particular to what you showed here also that the different options which you have in genome editing with a, with a second, the third and so on uh, version also shows that maybe even so 
with regard to the safest way or the more efficient way, or even if you think that later, as you said, for in vivo delivery, what is also size-wise and also there safety-wise possible, there's really a toolbox which which exploded in the in the last. Um, few years it's really really amazing and before i come back to that question we had we had a question from cecilia Jimenez, who asked do you know of any commercial or available source of base editors purified proteins such as the carcerotene uh, not as a plasmid thanks um i i think there are some emerging i think aldevron is one company that um may provide that. Um, but I think it's a challenge. One thing, so for our studies, um, we use this Apobec3A uh, N57Q BE3 version of a C-base editor. And one of the reasons we did that was because we could actually um, uh, purify to high um, uh, yield um, and purity the ribonucleoprotein. Um, whereas for other base editors, um, it's been somewhat challenging to do that. So an alternative delivery uh, can be with mRNA, which um, can have some of the same advantages of a transient pulse um, and may obviate the need for protein purification. Um, I, I assume lots of commercial uh, 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 vendors are interested in this area and I anticipate there'll be more and more options uh, going forward. But a challenge is as this toolbox um, explodes and there's always a new variant or version, um, it's hard for to keep up, for anyone to keep up. And, and so um, uh, having access to the high quality material when there's an explosion of options uh, is certainly a challenge. We have a question from Alessandro Ombach, University of Trento. Um, have you already tested prime editing to repair mutation which causes a genetic disease? If so, how difficult is to find an efficient uh, RNA based on your um, experience? Like RNA. We don't have, uh, we have really minimal experience. So I, I can't say much from personal experience. I think um, certainly, a challenge of the prime editing is that the design um, is more complicated. There's more variables, um, not only the, the target um, spacer sequence, but the, the priming sequence, and then often a second nicking sequence. And so there's many, many combinations that could be explored for even one target. So unlike the sort of nucleus editing or base editing where the screens I described, you can pretty much design um, from first principles all the possible reagents. Uh, prime editing is more complicated. Um, and from not my direct experience, but kind of what I've um, heard from others is that although it can work very well, it requires a fair amount of optimizing these variables for a specific site. Um, so it, it's certainly some sort of investment of time, at least at the current stage, but hopefully the rules will be elucidated and that will be simplified going forward. So if if we stick now a little bit to the modification of, for example, the hematopoietic cells, you already showed your, uh, your investigations on if there is an option of homologous uh, repair or NHEJ and so on. But when we look, for example, also on, on, the, on the viability of the cell, let's say, it, because you have to do a lot of modifi modification because you bring something in, but also then also something happens to the genome of the cells. Um, so can you comment a bit on what you or others have experienced with regard to engraftment, uh, survival, and so on? Yeah, so I mean, we were um, concerned about that, but really pleasantly surprised um, once we had very high quality ribonucleoprotein um, the cells tolerate the electroporation very well. In fact, a lot of the toxicity we had seen in earlier types of electroporation could be attributed to the plasma DNA we were using, which is very toxic. And uh, um, the ribonucleoprotein is quite um, well tolerated by the cells. So we would typically see, you know, 
80 to 90 percent viability of cells following the electroporation. And then um, when we look at um, the engraftment of the cells, uh, we see outstanding engraftment. Um, and in fact, when we achieve the high level gene editing, um, we don't see any drop off of the um, gene modified cells compared to the unmodified cells competing in the same cell product. Uh, we do, if we um, um, measure in vitro, um, see a pulse of a DNA damage response, not surprisingly, because our goal is to induce DNA damage at the target site. Um, and so we see uh, P21, a P53 target gene, peaks in the early hours after the electroporation, but by 24 to 48 hours, it's back to baseline levels. Um, so it, it's really um, handled well by the cells. And then if we look at the cells that have been grafted, we don't see any gene expression changes in those cells. So there's no lasting um, uh, transcriptional effects that we are able to observe. Um, now, for um, any sort of hematopoietic transplant, whether it's allogeneic uh, or autologous gene modified or not, um, the quality of the cells, both in number and in, in their um, uh, viability uh, and other um, qualitative characteristics is critically important for the transplant outcomes. And in fact, um, the cell, there's a, a, a really um, exquisite relationship between input cell number and um, engraftment uh, potential. So for any of these modifications, starting with a really good cell product and, and enough cells is key to achieving um, clinical success, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, we have not received any further questions. So I, I would like then to close our um, e-school for today and would like to thank you again for this wonderful talk and uh, exciting insight. And would like to say goodbye to you and would like also to invite our audience to, to visit us next week when we have a talk from Ben about nucleases used for gene editing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.